As those of you present know, we're in our series entitled Toward. Say Toward. And basically the premise for all those who are here for the first time and visitors, the idea is that it's so easy to move away from three categories of people. And in fact, we've taught you in many respects in sermons to move away from difficult, damaged, and what else? Different people. So to make sure I'm in the right place. Yet there is no exhortation to move into this reality biblically, but in the Bible we find that we don't flee from difficult people. We don't attempt for self-preservation's sake to move into escapism, but we actually are called to interact with often here we go again, una mas. The difficult, if you can't say amen, say ouch. The damaged, which always takes a little bit of work. And here we go. And those who are different. We are in an increasing crisis. While there is an environmental erosion, Individuals deny with empirically observable data that it's happening. As the world literally is becoming more polluted, uh, the planet, uh, we're leaving our carbon footprint and literally eroding the health of the planet with scientific data. People look at that and there is no urgency to shift behavior. I didn't get too many amens on that. But while that is significant, there is also, in the same fashion, a widening social chasm, a divide between individuals. I mean, can't you feel it in the air? Uh, people that didn't have an attitude before are empowered with all kinds of attitudes. Uh, things that have laid under the surface have been dormant. Uh, people are just saying, as, as it comes to mind, there is a widening social chasm, a divide that runs the risk of unraveling the fabric of, quite honestly, if it hasn't happened already, human decency. And if we don't learn to become good neighbors, there's going to be a significant challenge, the same way the earth is progressively moving toward, again, the scenario I just created socially. We're moving in the same direction. And I'm waiting for someone to say, we have a problem here. Yet there are very few voices who are willing to move out of their silos to help create dialogue to deal with this issue, and quite honestly, while I am not anti-media or social media, it's perpetuating the difference because now as we go on to the internet and onto social media, it's feeding us with the algorithms, more opinions that are just like ours, more views that are like ours. And when we meet each other in public, both of us are shocked, both us and the other, whoever your other is, we're shocked that someone can even believe that, but we've conditioned ourselves or been conditioned for that sort of increasing social chasm. What better time than this February to look back and to glean from the proven methods and motivations of those who came before us in the face of insurmountable odds, many became biblically certified neighbors. They taught the broader culture to do the same, often in the face of opposition. They didn't run from difficulty, but they moved toward I holler back so I just know you're awake. Uh, they moved, yeah, they didn't move away. With, with fire hoses, literally spraying them down, they moved toward difficult folks. With, with dogs being sicked on them, they moved 
accord with those who didn't think they were worthy to sit at the same counters. They did not escape them, but they moved toward those individuals. Because if we don't move toward the damage, the difficult, or the different, then there is no way of releasing what we carry in the environments we dwell in. Let me just make sure I'm in the right place. Is there anybody willing to move toward difficulty? Let me see your hands. Uh, the rest of you, hopefully, by the time we finish, you'll be with us. Jesus, the man says, who is my neighbor? Jesus, I love him. He doesn't just answer this in a linear manner, but Jesus answers in a circular manner. I love Jesus because when he answers in this parable, when he answers in a circular manner, it hits us on all levels. It answers the man's question, but it also takes him on the journey. He says, who's my neighbor? Jesus says, all right, here's the answer. As the man sits at the edge of his seat, he says, there was a man. You gotta love him who was coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And now I want you to see this. There is foreshadowing and there is revelation even in the illustration that he chooses to use. He said he comes from Jerusalem, say Jerusalem, on his way to Jericho. There is a 3,500 foot elevation, as you know, if you've ever been to the, the Holy Land, you hear about and you see that the temple was situated on the top of a mountain, and often as the pilgrims would go there for a high holy day, they would sing songs with one another. As they went progressively higher, they would sing songs that are called Psalms of Ascent. God, I love the word. As they move toward this encounter with God, as they move toward these high, this high holy day, they would climb the mountain. And as they climbed the mountain, they would get to the top of the mountain on Jerusalem where the temple was situated. But on their way there, they sang psalms of ascent in preparation for a true and authentic in their mind encounter with God. This is where you get beautiful terminology. It was picturesque. I will enter into your gates with thanksgiving into your courts with praise. There was preparation to encounter God. But interestingly, there is Jesus, when he asks, who is my neighbor, he inverts this journey. He turns it upside down. He says, this is not men traveling or women traveling to an encounter with God, but they're now coming from Jerusalem back down to Jericho. They're coming from an encounter with God back into the, their normal daily lives. They are not going up, but they are now coming down. There is a geographical cold descent as they go progressively lower. But not only is there a geographical descent as they go from Jerusalem to Jericho. So don't you see it? There is also a religious descent. Somehow these folks that have had this unique encounter on this high holy day with the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. As they come down off this mountain from this high holy day, somehow they are not able to bring this unique encounter that they've had as it relates to their religious experience back in a practical manner into the fabric of their day-to-day -day lives. I, I have the time to deal with this, and I promise you I'm not going to get much sweatier than this, so you may as well get your amen in right now. But I wonder, I wonder if you know what it is um, to have had a beautiful encounter with the Lord, but by the time Monday rolls around, hmm, in fact, before Monday even rolls around, some of you leave this high holy experience and you can't get to the parking lot good before uh, your wretchedness, oh, the sinful man that I am, or your ratchetness 
uh, whatever generation you're from, kicks in. Is there's often a disconnect between the religious experience and then how that religious experience works into the practical areas of our life. I remember leaving church service over on Gundry. I mean, we had some stupid church that day. I'm talking about high five your neighbor, crying, snotting, sweating. I had to go get a new outfit after I left that service. It was through the roof. But interestingly, after leaving that service, I'm driving down the street, and one of the sisters that was in the choir saying amen to everything I said that day, I was driving down the street, and she was crossing the street. And so I would decide, I decided as a pastor, I wanted to greet the sister that had just been touched by the Lord. And so I blew my horn to greet her. Her assumption was that I was blowing to tell her to get out of the way. She did not even turn around to see who it was. She kept walking first before, she didn't look. Usually your head comes first and then your body comes. Her hand flew back. <laughs> Kids in the room. And she gave me some sign language. Hand went back, sign language, then her neck rolled back. And she lifted the sign a little bit higher and still didn't realize it was me. Kept on walking to go straight to the liquor store. All I'm trying to say is she had a holy hand. But somehow... I thought she was in the house sabotaging. <laughs> but somehow, that experience didn't work its way into the fabric of her day-to-day -day life. I, we can laugh at her, we can blame her, but the question is, how many of us have high holy experiences? only to find that when we get back to the routine of life, when we get back to our office, when we get back to our households, we go back into our normal business. The Bible says that these men, there was, there was a religious descent. They, they didn't bring the holy experience into their day-to-day -day lives, but they literally saw this man who was suffering. The Bible says that they, they crossed the street. Then there was a moral, there was geographical descent, there was a religious descent, but then there is a moral descent. You don't have to be a holy one to see someone laying in that condition, the Bible says, half dead. Forget what I believe, forget who I pray to, forget what kind of religious experience I just had, what kind of church service I just came from. I mean, let me appeal to the humanity in you. Is there anything that sees the need for help or to extend assistance to someone who's suffering? The Bible says the first two men that came, the first the priest and then the Levite, it says when they saw him, they didn't even want to get tied up. They crossed the street and turned a blind eye to the suffering of the one that was there. I don't know why they turned a blind eye. Because can I tell you, when it comes to damaged people, when it comes to difficult people, and when it comes to different people, interaction and engagement can often be uncomfortable. It can cost us to extend the extra help we need. I mean, all of us are guilty of it. There are some members that need a little bit more help than others. And sometimes I feel like if I were honest, crossing the street. <laughs> you didn't see me? Oh, Since you've judged me, I feel the spirit of judgment on you. 
there, there, there are some family members you see at the family reunion, you see them coming and you get sick all of a sudden and go home. Because before they hide, say hello, they say, can I hold something? Can I hold something? Can I? It takes extra work often to deal with damage, the different and <laughs> the difficult. There we go. These men literally walk by them, put their blinders on, and act as if they didn't see them. It, it took some effort. But my question is, come on, watch the moral descent. Some have argued that they didn't want to defile themselves, the priest and the Levite, to help this man out. Because if they had touched him and he was dead, they would have become officially or technically ceremonially unclean. And they wouldn't have been able to participate in the religious festival. But notice the text does not say they were on their way up. But it says as they were coming from Jerusalem down to Jericho, they were going down. Down, not up. They were coming from the religious ceremony, not going to the religious ceremony. So it was not that they would become ceremonially unclean by seeing what was going on this, with this man. I felt like they just felt they would be inconvenienced and they didn't have time. Isn't it interesting how we can have an encounter with God but not time for people that God loves? And one of the things I try to practice is I don't get so busy with paperwork that I don't have time for a little people work. How much time do we spend in our families doing for them as opposed to being with them? The Bible says that he came, he, they walked by the man, they passed him by. Now, here's what messes me up. Even if it would, they felt it would have made them ceremony unclean, they could have looked. They didn't have to touch him. They could have looked and said, bl blown a whistle, a shofar, said, help, come check on him, and kept going. The Bible said they didn't even take time to yell to the appropriate parties to come help this man that was on the curb. The Bible says they just kept on going. So there was a geographical descent. There was a religious descent. In my estimation, there was a moral descent. But then the third thing is, there is an interestingly, an irony in characters. The same way as that there were, there were three descents, there were also three people and here's how it should have gone if the story was told properly. First, the priest, the most noble, the most pious, comes by and walks away. Then the Levite, who was helpful for the affairs of the house of God, but was not as high-ranking spiritually, was not as pious as the priest, he should have stopped by. But the one that actually ends up stopping is the Samaritan. The one in all actuality that shouldn't have stopped. Samaritans and Jews at that time, there was a pronounced division. They wouldn't even speak. They were hostile. They talked about one another. They had pet names. They had names, offensive names for one another. It was, you did not want to be caught if you were Jewish sitting with a Samaritan. If you're Samaritan being caught with a Jew, it would have caused ridicule from your own community. You would have been the outlier. Yet, the priest walks by, the Levite walks by, and while they, the Bible says, cross the street, the Samaritan comes. He sees the man sitting there half dead and said that he went to him. It said, secondly, that he was moved with compassion. It says he bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and, and wine to bandage up, to seal his wounds. He took him, he picked him up, he put him on his animal, carried him to the end. While they get to the end, he actually cares for this man like it was someone he knew. 
He has to move on about his business, but he leaves two denarii there with the innkeeper and says, listen to me, spend this for my friend or this stranger. Then he says, listen, when I come back, if it costs you more than this, his tab is on me. Notice the irony. It is not the priest that stops for the Samaritan. It is not the Levite that stops for the Samaritan. But the one that should have crossed the street is actually the one that stops to be a blessing to him. Now hear me, hear me, hear me. Keep what Jesus is teaching in focus. Well, I'm grateful that everyone calls someone who does a good deed the good Samaritan. Oh, no, it was much deeper than that in this biblical text. This was not a story about someone who has done a good deed. A good Samaritan is not simply someone who does a good deed. Remember, 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 remember. Jesus is asking the question, answering the question to the man about who your neighbor is. Ahe. Ahe. And he takes a long time to do it. But here's the idea. He says, you ask me who the neighbor is. The assumption would be that it's the priest or the Levite. The one that would be a religiously affiliated with him. You would assume it is his fellow brother, as he speaks to this congregation of people that shared the same ethnicity, he says, you would have assumed that it would be one of them. But yet, this person that is not only different, but this person who our tribe is in a hostile relation with, you never would have assumed that he would have stopped. That is the very one that stopped to come check on this man on the side of the road. Can you see the message here? In a time where there is more pronounced division in our country than any other time in my lifetime, where Democrats can't stand Republicans, Republicans can't stand the Democrats, where Christians can't stand Muslims, Muslims can't stand Christians, and Jews can't stand a certain people and other people can't stand Jews and are being vocal about it in the public sphere, in the public square, where the citizens are, are working against those who are non-citizens. Are you still here with me? In this time of, again, pronounced societal separation, the call to the church, the call to the believers, can we stop talking about the rest of the world? Let's just talk about the church. If some of our brothers and sisters in other contexts who call themselves Christian would stand, uh, Christians would stand up, this could shift. But even within the context of the church, we lift our hands on Sunday to praise the same God. We're overlooking the wounds of others. The Bible says, what's Jesus teaching us? Revolutionary. Listen to me. Because neighbor in all by our standard means those that are closest in proximity, in belief, in worldview. Oh, those are my neighbors. Jesus said, uh-uh. That's too easy. Too easy. And I know you, you're wired to protect yourself. It is an evolutionary process. It is your flight or fight response. It is, it is self-preservation. You are physically, physiologically wired for self-preservation. When you sense a threat, you want to escape it. He said, but I filled you with a spirit that has the ability to rewire your thinking, to rewire your behavioral patterns. To, he says, now I know it sounds crazy. He says, but I'm going to teach you how to love those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. I got two claps. I'm going to teach you. This is the Bible. I'm going to teach you how to bless your love, your enemies. He says, because uh, you escaping this and preserving yourself is the natural inclination. But what do you need me for? He said, but in my kingdom, he said, your neighbor is not the one that is most like you. 
He says, your neighbor is the one that is least like you. Can I tell you what is rolling the fabric of society? No one's willing to put themselves in harm's way to do the difficult task of being a bridge builder instead of hypothetically speaking bridges and walls I, I don't have time to work through this but but I just, when the wall illustration is what you need nothing else will do we, we there are very few that are willing to be brokers of peace brokers of understanding and one of the things I'm fighting against as there is more hostility spoken in the public space the natural inclination is for us just to gather with people that look like us and to to create the other to gather with people that believe like us and to create the other but Jesus says you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your mind with all of your strength and listen and you have to do that first because if you can't do the first part of that you don't have any chance of making it to the second part of that because you need a true connection with God <laughs> God help me in this place to connect with folks that at times are working against you, to build a bridge as they're pushing back, to give understanding where there is ignorance, to make a way where there is no way, to forge a path when nobody in your party is pulling you in that direction. It takes a true connection with God. He says you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. Now you thought your neighbor was the person you went to church with. You thought your neighbor was the other the one that you understand they under they, they just understand you you thought your neighbor was the one that lived one or two houses over but what he said your neighbor is not the one that looks most like you he says your neighbor is the one that is least like you anybody can connect with the one that's most like them the question is can you connect with the one that is least like you and bring the love of God bring encouragement bring healing to the wounds that they're experiencing and here's what I found most people their separation with most people simply because they're wounds you look at them as adversarial but often there's a little boy that was wounded somewhere there was somebody that was abused hurting people hurt people but where are, when are the healers going to st stand up where are the folks with the oil, with the wine, where are the folks that'll pick people up as they're cussing them out? Put them on the beast and say, I know exactly what you need. Just come on, come on, come on, come on then. We're gonna get you together. If there's a message, and I may get criticism for it, that we need to hear in this hour, if we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, God says the neighbor starts not with the one that is most like you, but the one that is least like you. And I don't know about you, I'm tired of doing church as usual. I'm tired of doing life as usual. I'm tired of just towing the party line as usual. Are you with me? But I'm crazy enough to color outside of the lines. I'm crazy enough to reach out to some folks that may not be feeling me. I'm crazy enough to watch the grace and the healing and the mercy and the understanding and divine wisdom of God begin to draw people together that, that have been separated otherwise because if not more of the same will be perpetuated the Bible says that your neighbor is the one that's least like you and God commands you to love your neighbor now we're done with this but listen how do we move forward how do we move forward as a society that there there's a relevant message for us as believers layered relevant message for us as Antioch there's a message for the education system there is there's a message for the political system there there's a message for the religious community and here it is if you're writing this down I want you to get this the first two that came by their apathy caused them to not see about the man that was laying down but something came over this Samaritan and here's the process 
We have to move from our seat of, of apathy. If it's not my group, I don't care. If it doesn't affect me, I don't care. The fabric of humanity has knit us all together. Listen, you may not care now, but eventually what you don't care about will ultimately affect you. So here it is. We've got to move from a position of apathy. Not with people like you, but people that are different than you. From apathy, here it is. To proximity. Say proximity. See, the challenge with the first two is they saw the condition of the man. They got further away from him. But this Samaritan saw the condition of the man and drew closer to him in proximity. He came to where he was. In the condition that he was in, he couldn't expect him to find him. But he came to where he was. Can I tell you that if you want transformation in society, if you want transformation uh, in your, your sphere of influence, you've got to move out of apathy, move from where you are, and to go where people that don't sound like you, that don't look like you, that don't believe like you, you have to go to where they are. No true lasting transformation internally comes without proximity. Are you still here with me? Your assignment when you leave here is to go and friend some people on social media that you can't stand. Because their ideas every now and then need to hear your timeline so you know how to minister. And quite honestly, it may even change your opinion. There must be proximity. Beautiful thing about this Cal State Long Beach Initiative is you didn't send a memo. You didn't send a, a care package. But you said, let me step into this environment. Let me, let me see where the people worship. Let me see where the people gather that we're, we're trying to reach and retain. You could have heard me at lunch, but you said, let me come to where they dwell. We must move from apathy to proximity. And when you move into proximity, here's what happens. You develop empathy. You don't develop empathy from people you're disconnected from. But when you see where they live and you hear a conversation and they welcome you into their house, then the position you had in theory begins to shift as you have gained proximity. You move from apathy to proximity to empathy. Bible says that this man was moved with compassion when he got close to him. But then we move from empathy because empathy is not good enough. We need to move from empathy to engagement. I don't want to feel bad in my heart but not do something about it. I don't want to be convicted in my spirit but not practically move forward in unity. Are you still here with me? The Bible said he moved into engagement. Last one, last piece final thing he did and people thought they just made this up in the 20th century but let me let you know that this was in this message of what it means to be neighborly law a couple thousand years ago he didn't just give him enough to get him off of the street but he engaged with him and he stayed committed into the process until he got back up on his feet. Listen to me. What is this? It is from apathy to what? To proximity to empathy to engagement to not equality but equity. He didn't just throw some things his way and keep on moving. Are you with me? But he ensured that he had what he needed to get back up on his feet and succeed. It was not simply a handout, but this man was in a deficit position. And we in society need to understand there are some people that are coming from a deficit position. And they don't 
just need equality, but they need equity. They need everything they can to get back up on their feet. And there's something about people that had a hand reach down to pull them up. Once they get back in the race, those folks are hard to stop because they remember what it was to be left for dead. They remember what it is to, for people to walk by them. They remember what it is not to have opportunity. But when they get back up on their feet, they run like no one's business. Look at somebody, tell them this may make me unpopular, but I'm called to love my neighbor. I'm called to help folks that don't look like me because all of us somewhere are in a deficit position. You may be in a financial deficit. You may be in a political deficit. You may be in a spiritual deficit. All of us are in a deficit position, which means we need one another as a community, as neighbors to help get us back up on our feet. And whenever the fabric of society is sewn together again, all things are possible. Come on, somebody lift up your voice. If you believe it, if you'll be committed, not to running away from, but running toward the damage, the difficult, and the different. We have to go, but give somebody a hug. So I'm committed, I'm committed, I'm committed. I'm committed to being a good neighbor. We may not see it the same way, but I'm committed to being a good neighbor. We can turn this city around if we learn how to be neighbors. We can turn this nation around if we learn how to be neighbors. I'm not, this is not lip service, but look at him. Tell him I love you. I love you. I don't even know you that well, but I love you. I love you by faith. We didn't vote for the same person, but I love you. We don't have the same money in our pocket, but I love you. We may have different levels of influence, but I love you. And you are my neighbor. You are my neighbor. There's nothing you can do about it. So, Father, we thank you. Great God of heaven, we thank you. Now, we pray your blessing on these, your people. Lord, teach us what it is to be neighbors and then give us the fortitude to cross the chasm of our difference to move into authentic encounter.